Revenge rarely solves your problems, but boy does it feel good to get your own back. You want to steal my lunch? Then enjoy the sick burn I'm about to leave on this sticky note, except not all revenge is plotted equally. While I'm a huge fan of passive-aggressive messages, they don't compare to getting someone arrested, costing them millions of dollars, or leveling their entire life with a single revelation. With that said, put those sticky notes and witty quips away, because we're about to take a look at even more tales of revenge that wreaked nuclear levels of destruction. Major Breakdown Car mechanics don't have it easy. When they're not trying to work out how you poured wiper fluid in your oil fill pour for the 48th time, I'm so sorry, Bob. They have to deal with some deplorable customers, like this Reddit user's father did. Back in the early 2000s, this mechanic ran his own independent repair shop. One day, a man came in with an expensive-looking convertible, which needed its transmission fixed. It took a while to remove, disassemble, fix, and reassemble, but our mechanic got the job done. However, when it came time to pay up, Mr. Convertible suddenly couldn't afford it. He said he could pay half now and the other half in a week or so. Now, being a stand-up guy in a small town, our mechanic agreed. But a uh, few weeks go by and Mr. Convertible is nowhere to be seen. After two months, our mechanic called him and asked when he'd be paying the rest of his bill. And here's the kicker. Mr. Convertible simply said he wouldn't be paying. There was nothing wrong with the repairs, but now that he had the car, he just didn't see why he should pay the rest. At first, our mechanic got mad, but then he decided to make an example out of Mr. Convertible. He called up a towing company, told them the situation, and explained that under state law, he had a mechanic's lien on the vehicle, which is the legal right to sell it for compensation of unpaid debt. The rules of this vary from state to state in America, but our mechanic was able to get the tow company to pick up the convertible and take it away. To his shop? Oh no. To the local recycling center. The car was crushed, scrapped, and the remnants sold to the center, making our mechanic his money back before Mr. Convertible could do anything. Obviously, he was furious and turned up to the repair shop with the state patrol the next day. However, after our mechanic explained the circumstances of the lien, the troopers declared it a civil matter, not a criminal one. And when Mr. Convertible tried to sue our mechanic, the judge dismissed the case. Moral of the story, pay your mechanics. Unless you'd prefer your car scrap metal shaped. Oh, brother. We all know that one person who has a habit of making someone else's special day all about them. Your birthday party? Well, they just got a promotion. Your big announcement? Well, they just bought a new car. <sighs> now, don't worry, though. You're not alone. One Reddit user, who we'll call Ben, had a younger brother called Todd, who just had to be the center of attention no matter the occasion. So much so that at their sister's baby shower, Todd and his girlfriend announced they were expecting. Like, Come on, man, hold your own event. But he wasn't done there. The day before Ben's wedding, a receipt for an expensive ring fell out of Todd's pocket. It was clear he was planning to propose to his girlfriend during Ben's special day. Ben kicked him from the groom's party, but Todd started crying about how unfair it was and that he would never propose during someone else's wedding. So Ben allowed him to come to the wedding as a guest, but warned him if he tried anything, he'd regret it. Sure enough, during his new wife's dad-daughter dance, Todd got down on one knee and proposed to his girlfriend in sight of everyone. But Ben wasn't angry. In fact, he was excited. Because, as Todd was stealing the spotlight, a heavily pregnant guest walked over and began to make a scene. She was screaming at Todd for lying to her, crying and claiming she was pregnant with his baby. She even called his phone, proving they'd been in contact. Distraught, Todd's girlfriend flung the ring down and left in tears. Ben was also in tears. From laughing, 
With the green light from his soon-to-be wife, he'd hired a woman to pretend to be Todd's side piece, asked her to be at the wedding and to act out if she saw him make the move to propose. Ben had even given her his number to make it convincing. And it was so convincing that Todd's girlfriend threw him out. Well, we can only hope that after all that, Todd figured out that he is not, in fact, life's main character. A dish best served, ice cold. Have you ever been cheated on? <sighs> Nothing hurts quite like it, trust me. But stories like those from Reddit user Kermit Defrog are a tonic for anyone who's ever had their heart broken. Kermit was married to his high school sweetheart, Sue, for 23 years. With two grown kids together, a nice house, cars, and dream vacations, they were living the American dream. But while Kermit was recovering from knee surgery, Sue began acting differently. She'd started working late, wasn't as affectionate, and changed the passwords on all her devices. Initially, Kermit didn't suspect anything, but as he was scrolling through social media, he saw a picture of Sue with a male co-worker who she seemed close with. Very close. What was weird, though, was that despite having never met him, he'd blocked Kermit. Now he was suspicious. Using his family data plan, he downloaded an app that displayed all text messages being sent and received on all connected devices, one of them being Sue's phone. And that's when his heart sank. Sue was sending lovey-dovey messages and a lot of, uh, shall we say, incriminating photos to this guy. For three days, Kermit processed the information. But on the fourth day, he began plotting his exit strategy and his revenge. Now recovered from his surgery, he began acting the same way Sue had been, pulling long hours at work, being cold and distant, changing passwords on his devices. It wasn't long before Sue noticed, recognizing all the telltale signs of a partner having an affair. Eventually, she had the audacity to confront him, accusing him of cheating. He laughed in her face for a full two minutes, because despite his actions, she couldn't prove anything, and Kermit was bluffing. He'd been acting that way purely to make her paranoid. All the while, he was gathering evidence, making sure he was financially independent from her, stealthily moving his possessions out of their house, and shopping around for a new apartment, all without Sue knowing. For five long months, he acted aloof and cool, but Sue started to crack. In texts to her lover, Kermit could see she was getting cold feet, claiming she still loved Kermit and that his affair must be some sort of karma for her own actions. Oh, she had no idea. Eventually, she ditched her lover, explaining to him in text messages she wanted to win Kermit back. But Kermit couldn't have cared less. His plan was almost complete. At the start of December, he let both of his kids know what their mother had been up to and what he planned to do but asked them not to say anything. While upset, they both supported their dad. And so Kermit enacted his piece de resistance. Early on Christmas morning, while Sue slept, he left a thick printed binder full of messages she'd been sending to her lover over the past eight months on his pillow, along with his lawyer's card and a note reading, Merry Christmas. Savage. But that's not all. The binder was just one of 14 he'd sent out to all her friends, family, oh, and her place of work. With that, he ghosted her. Over the next two weeks, Sue's life imploded. Her family and friends turned their back on her, Kermit was granted an uncontested divorce, and while he left her the house, he got their cabin in the woods, and had slowly drained their joint accounts so that she couldn't claim a dime from him. And to add a cherry on top, both Sue and her lover were placed on administrative leave and fired soon after for breaching their rules about interwork relationships. Wow. Well, if I'm ever cheated on again, I know who I'm calling to help me plot my revenge. Park Cold When it comes to tales of revenge, it's always the ones that revolve around parking disputes that go the extra mile. Case in point, Reddit user Bright Rick has a parking revenge story that was served ice cold. 
Back in the early 2000s, Rick's family owned two apartment complexes out in the Chicago suburbs. They lived in some of the apartments, rented out the others, and owned a parking lot with a space for about 16 cars, more than enough for them and their tenants. But one day, cars started parking in the lot that didn't belong to them or their tenants. Rick blocked one of the cars in and called a tow company, when suddenly the owner came around and drove off over Rick's yard and bushes. Annoyed, Rick hired a local tow company and had them put up signs warning people that any car without a parking permit would be towed, and left it at that. But then, one freezing New Year's Eve, Rick arrived home to find every single space in the lot filled with cars that didn't belong to his family or tenants. There were so many cars that they were spilling out of the lot and lining the roads, blocking all the entrances to Rick's building. Someone was having a party, but he checked, and it was none of his residents. He rang the tow company, but they were too busy. So he decided to take matters into his own hands. He quickly gathered up three of his lawn sprinklers, attached them to his laundry room faucets, and ran hot water through them. Being below zero degrees out, the hot water stopped the hoses from freezing up. But once the water hit the cars and the sidewalks, thick layers of ice began to form. He moved each of the sprinklers every half hour or so, making sure the ice would get in between the window seals, handles, even the locks. Once every car was completely coated in a solid layer of ice, Rick packed everything up and went to bed. At 4 a.m., Rick was woken up by a group of very cold-looking people furiously pounding on his door and ringing his doorbell. They couldn't get into their cars for all the ice. Apparently, all these people had been told to park here by their friend who owned a building several blocks away. The very same guy who'd run over Rick's yard earlier that year. Rick just smiled and pointed out all the signs, telling them to move their cars or get towed, knowing full well they couldn't get into them. The cops showed up shortly after, laughing at the entire situation, before, with Rick's consent, ticketing every single illegally parked car, which were then all towed. What a way to bring in the new year. A business transition. In-laws. Some are good, some are bad, and some are downright rotten, as Reddit user LivingBunch6371 discovered. Some time ago, at just 18 years old, Living Bunch's sister-in-law came out as a trans woman. Like the loving, caring people they clearly were, her parents immediately threw her out. They denied her access to the car they'd bought her and her money, which was in their joint account. So, late at night, she had to walk eight miles to reach Living Bunch's house. Stunned, Living Bunch's husband tried to talk to their staunchly conservative parents, but they were resolute. Their now daughter was not welcome in their home because of who she was and all her possessions, including cash she'd earned working at a part-time job, were theirs now. This didn't sit well with Living Bunch, who loved her sister-in-law regardless of who she was. She and her husband wanted to cut all ties with the in-laws, which suddenly gave her an idea. Her father-in-law was a small business owner, and his biggest account just so happened to be with Living Bunch's employer. She told her boss what happened, and after mulling on it, he agreed that if she could find another supplier offering a similar rate to her father-in-law, he'd close their account. This is where it got tough. Her father-in-law offered a great rate that was practically impossible to beat, but Living Bunch looked down every avenue she could, and eventually, six months later, she found a different company offering a similar rate. During this time, her father-in-law had begun major renovations on the family house, so, to make sure this sudden loss of income would hit hardest, she waited an extra month, when his renovations were well and truly underway, before informing her boss. Another month later, and the father-in-law's business was suddenly crushed. He had to scramble to find new clients and ended up having to sell the house to keep his business afloat. But because it was halfway renovated, it didn't sell for much. It got so bad, both in-laws resorted to begging for money from other family members, but after the barbaric treatment of their own child, all of them resolutely said no. Eight years down the line, 
and they're still clawing their way out of the karmic mess they got themselves into. And to top it off, Living Bunch's sister-in-law is thriving now. Pretty ironic that if the in-laws hadn't kicked her out, they might still have a house. Greed the Room Nothing starts a family argument like the topic of inheritance. Seriously, if you want to cut Christmas short, just ask who's getting the lion's share of your relative's possessions when they pass, and watch the entire day go up in flames. It's such a huge topic of contention that Reddit user 327Nova was able to use it for some absolutely god-tier revenge several years ago. Nova had a greedy, manipulative, money-hungry cousin who leaned on their wealthy grandparents for every little thing. But Nova didn't care about the money. They just loved their grandparents and wanted to spend time with them. So, when their grandma passed away, Nova moved in with their grandpa to help take care of him. Nova's cousin didn't like this one bit, assuming they were trying to curry favor and steal the lion's share of the inheritance. One day, Nova came home to discover that one of their cousin's children had apparently found a loaded gun and was playing with it. A gun Nova's grandpa had entrusted to them. Nova knew their gun's safety and swore they'd never leave a gun just lying around, let alone one that was loaded. While their grandpa believed them, they asked Nova to move out until things had calmed down. Suddenly, it all made sense. Nova's cousin had framed them to get them out of the way, all in hopes of getting closer to their grandpa's wallet. Nova worked on fixing their relationship with their grandpa, but a month later, he sadly passed away. Nova was devastated. After the funeral, the will was read out. And that's when Nova noticed some very specific wording. It was complex, but it boiled down to, if anyone tries to claim more than they've been given, they get nothing. Suddenly, Nova had the perfect idea for a revenge trap. Later that day, they rang their cousin and casually mentioned all of their grandma's jewelry would be donated to a charity auction. Unable to resist, the cousin immediately drove over to their grandparents' house and began filling shoeboxes with all the jewelry they could get their hands on, hoping no one would miss it before it was donated. As they were doing so, Nova's father and the family lawyer walked into the house to do some final admin catching the cousin red-handed trying to make off with four shoeboxes stuffed full of jewelry. Nova knew the lawyer was scheduled to visit that day and baited the trap so the cousin would show up at the most incriminating moment. Thanks to his own greed, the cousin never received a single penny of the inheritance. I don't know how much Nova was left, but that story is priceless. Disability Blowout there's a special circle of hell for people who use disabled parking bays when they themselves aren't disabled. What, you think the disabled community doesn't have it hard enough already? Well, back in the early 90s, the father of Reddit user Drumhead was a disabled Florida resident who got their own back in style. They would pulled up to their local store and were about to park in the handicap bay when a woman in a bright pink red Porsche shot into it. He rolled down his window and told her he needed to park there, pointing to his disability placard. But she snapped back, you don't look disabled, and walked into the store. First off, not all disabilities are visible. And second, that incredibly ignorant remark was about to cost her big time. Drumhead's dad got out of his car and removed the caps from all four of her tires before parking just far away enough to hear what was about to happen. After a while, the woman returned from the store, only to find all four of her tires completely flat. She began screaming that her Porsche had been vandalized and asked the store clerks to call the police. But when the police arrived, they immediately handed her a $250 ticket for being parked in a disabled bay without a placard and advised her she ring a tow company. Once they'd gone, Drumhead's dad wheeled around and shouted, You don't look disabled, but your car sure does before driving off. Now that is a next level burn. Fares fair. Taxi drivers do not have an easy job. From drunken passengers to unspeakable backseat antics, it's a pretty thankless career choice. 
However, Reddit user the Windigo's grandmother, who used to be a taxi driver, didn't suffer no fools. Back in the 1970s, she was a cab driver in Newcastle, England. One night, she picked up a fare and dropped him off, but when she asked for her money, the guy tried to cheese it. Unfortunately for him, this woman wasn't going home empty-handed. Seeing him trying to make a dash for it, she hit the gas and rolled over the guy's foot before parking on top of it. Screaming and crying, the attempted fee dodger still refused to pay her. It wasn't long before the police showed up and after explaining the situation, the police, no sympathy for the guy, reached into his pocket and gave her the money she was owed. They then asked her politely to get off the guy's foot before sending her on her way. But did her night end there? Not by a long shot. A few hours later, she's waiting in a taxi rank for another fare when two men walk up to her window, supporting a hobbling man. The thief from before. It took him a moment to recognize her, but when he did, oh, did the insults flow. Graciously, she then explained to his friends that he'd unsuccessfully tried to mug her off before. She then offered to take them, but this fee thief would have to take another cab. Appalled by their pal's behavior, the two got in, leaving the thief slack-jawed on the sidewalk. She then enacted the final part of her revenge by getting down and yelling to cabs down the rest of the rank that no one should take the fee thief before driving off. Oh, I bet that was one walk of shame he'll never forget. Don't mess with grandma. There are sleazes, there are scumbags, and then there are people who prey on the elderly, like this next pair of despicable idiots. According to this story posted on Reddit, someone used to know a sweet old lady from their local church. She was a retired nurse, had never married, and had no children, but did have family in the form of her niece and nephew. One day, she suffered a major heart attack and was rushed to hospital. She wasn't expected to survive. But before she had officially kicked the bucket, her niece and nephew decided to act like she had. They rocketed up to her apartment and began loading up her possessions, including all her fine crystal and silverware. The only problem was that despite her fatal prognosis, she survived. And when she returned home, her furniture, utensils, even her dishes were all gone. Who would steal from an old woman like that? They may as well have taken her purse from the hospital bed. Well, her neighbors wasted no time informing her they'd seen her greedy niece and nephew carting everything away. They denied it furiously, and she never pressed charges. A few years later, she finally did pass on, but after her heart attack, she'd made a few adjustments to her will. Prior to the thievery incident, everything was set to be left to her beloved niece and nephew. Now, they were each to receive just one dollar, and the rest of her estate would be going to the church. How much was the estate? Oh, just a small, humble nine million dollars. Yeah, hope the dishes were worth it, you ungrateful dolts. Boy toys. The only thing that feels worse than being cheated on is meeting the person you're being cheated on with. It really gets the inadequacy complex going. However, Reddit user PurePepper3666 had the opposite of this problem. Several years ago, Pepper's girlfriend told him she was cheating on him, and to rub salt in the wound, she informed him that in order to still be friends, he would just need to grow up and deal with it. Initially, because he did still want to be her friend, Pepper said yes. But she kept sending him pictures of her and her new boyfriend being all lovey-dovey together like a complete sadist. Hurt and depressed, Pepper tried to get on with his life in a grounded and healthy way. What, with therapy? Ha. Huh. No, Tinder. But while he was swiping left and right, he came across a very familiar face. Lo and behold, it was his ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend, the same one she'd been cheating on him with and the one she was still dating. Realizing he could enact a little revenge, he swiped right and matched with him. The two began talking and he revealed he was bisexual and also he had no idea who Pepper was. Their conversations became ever more flirty and after a few weeks and a couple of dates, 
He was falling deeply in love with Pepper, while still in a relationship with his girlfriend. Eventually, Pepper told him that if he was serious about their relationship, then he needed to leave his girlfriend for good. Next thing you know, Pepper was getting messages from his ex, utterly distraught, saying she'd just been dumped and that she regretted ever leaving him. To land the final blow, Pepper sent her a selfie of him and her now ex-boyfriend looking all lovey-dovey together with the message, Your boyfriend? You mean this guy? After that, he went full scorched earth and dumped his new boyfriend as well. It was all an act. He hated cheaters and figured he could get back at both of them by playing them against one another. And boy, had it worked. Moral of this story, cheaters never change their spots. Which of these stories gave you the most schadenfreude? And do you have any nuclear revenge stories of your own? Let me know down in the comments below. And thanks for watching.